All right, guys, welcome back. Now we're ready to move ahead in the PowerPoint on the federal budget and challenges to fiscal policy that are posed by the limits we face in contemporary society. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about how this actually works and why we find ourselves in the situation that we, we do. A um, couple of basics first. Let me get rid of my face. Um, we're going to start with uh, things to remember about the federal budget. OK, I'm going to give you some brief definitions and then I'm going to elaborate by showing you short little videos from I found on YouTube that define exactly what we need to know for this test. A um, couple of things. Um, you really have to know the difference between the national debt and deficit spending. They sound kind of sort of similar, but they're not at all. Um, deficit spending happens on an annual basis. Every year that we spend more than what we take in in taxes, we meaning the federal government, uh, the idea is that we, we have a problem and that we have a leftover amount that still needs to be funded. That is the, the annual deficit for that year. If you take this year's deficit and last year's deficit and all the deficit spending that we've done each year of the history of the American government, if you add all of that money up together, what you get is a picture of the total national debt. So I hope that will be helpful. Think of debt as all the money that's owed by the U.S. government back to either individual investors or foreign um, agents. Um, deficit spending is an annual number that happens every year that we spend more than what we take in in taxes. Um, how the government borrows money involves a discussion of government bonds. Bonds for the investor, for the private investor, um, basically represent almost a sure bet. That's a low risk investment. Um, senior citizens who are getting ready to retire are often advised to take their money out of the risky, risky stock market that you've seen here lately and convert those investments or gains into bonds, uh, which are basically government loans. Um, you can also get a bond from a corporation, but we're talking about the federal budget. So let's focus on that for now. Um, the U.S. government will sell bonds typically when there is some objective that needs to be um, um, taken care of, like a world war or infrastructure building. Um, those those loans are, are bought up, are uh, basically provide uh, investor money for the government to spend now, but it creates an IOU that has to be paid back later. You and I are not able to sell bonds uh, in our own personal uh, affairs, so this is a little bit different. Um, basically, it explains the difference between our checkbooks, which, you know, when they're at zero, we don't do any more spending, versus the government checkbook, which can go on indefinitely as long as both houses of Congress agree to take on more debt. So we'll be talking about the debt ceiling in some of your homework, as well as um, uh, bond buying and bond selling at the federal government level. Um, crowding out effect. Um, if you're thinking about aggregate demand and aggregate supply, you'll probably remember that vertical range of the curve of the AS curve. That is basically the economy working as hard as it possibly can. Um, you're not likely to get a lot of whole new output there. If the government starts to decide a new spending campaign and they want to spend a lot of money, say, on education or housing for the homeless, um, they could very well um, kind of outpace what the economy is capable of doing. They could literally put the economy in overdrive so that everyone is suffering from higher interest rates and inflation. And that would be bad for consumers who are 70% of all spending and business investment, which is about 20%, kind of drives the growth of the economy. So think of crowding out effect as a situation where government spending is simply you know, outpacing what the economy is capable of doing. Um, servicing the debt is a phrase that we use to talk about interest payments that we make on the national debt every year. As long as they remain a small percentage of the overall federal spending plan or the federal budget for the year, then it's something that's manageable. But we need to talk about situations where that might not be the case. Um, in, in the Vietnam era where President Nixon was in charge, he chose to service the debt by simply printing more cash, right? Um, Federal uh, Reserve uh, ordered more money from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and suddenly we had too much cash in circulation. Well, that, with an oil crisis in 1974, led to record inflation at the end of the 70s that was really a problem for the American economy. 
Um, it meant that paper money was almost worthless and people were investing in assets like real estate and gold. So there are real problems when you don't account for servicing the debt the right way. So that's something that we'll talk about in the next couple of videos. Hi, I'm Adrian Hill. And I'm Jacob Clifford and welcome to Crash Course Economics. What's wrong with you? Today we're talking about deficits and debt. You've probably heard a lot about the national debt. So what is it and where does it come from and is it a problem? And most importantly, should you even care? First off, deficit and debt are not the same thing. A budget deficit is when the government spends more than it brings in in tax revenue in a given year. Then it has to borrow money to cover that year's shortfall. The debt is the accumulation of budget deficits. For example, let's start a country called, I don't know, Cliffordonia. It's a pretty cool name. In its first year, the Cliffordonian government brings in $400 of tax revenue and it spends $500 because starting a new country is kind of expensive. So in that year, the deficit is $100. Then the next year, it brings in $600 of tax revenue, but spends $800. That year's deficit is $200. To calculate Cliffordonia's debt, add up all those yearly deficits. So at the end of the second year, it has a debt of $300. $100 from the first year and $200 from the second year. Things are looking pretty tough for Cliffordonia. Not only is the nation in debt, but it also has an average tax revenue of only $500 a year. It's going to be difficult getting that space program off the ground at that rate. Let's leave the plight of Cliffordonia behind for a moment and talk about the real world. Specifically, let's talk about the United States, since it has the largest debt. Hooray, America number one. So how big is the debt right now? 18 trillion, 236 billion, 176 million, 274,963. No wait, 18 trillion, 236 billion, 176 million, 288,000. It's hard to keep up with, but it's a little over $18 trillion. So the number sounds really, really high. I have a hard enough time wrapping my head around millions and billions, not to mention trillions. The debt seems especially high when you look at the trend over time. First, we need to adjust that trend for inflation because dollars today are not the same as dollars in the past. Remember, we try to keep it real around here. Second, we really should be looking at debt as a percent of GDP. Why? Well, suppose I owe 200 bucks and a six-year-old owes $100. Which of us will have a harder time paying it off? Well, probably the six-year-old because even though my actual debt number is larger, I have a job. I have two jobs. What's your allowance, you unemployed six-year-old? In the same way, our GDP grows every year due to population growth and productivity increases, and our ability to sustain debt grows along with our income. So here is the US federal government debt as a percent of GDP. As you can see, it's risen over the past several years. So is that a bad thing? Well, there's a couple ways to look at it. First, compare the US to other developed nations. The US has a higher debt to GDP than other countries, but several other countries have a much higher ratio. Some of these are in crisis like Greece and Italy, but there are also other countries that are stable like Japan and France that have much higher levels of debt than the US. Second, most economists aren't concerned about the borrowing the US has done already because they're too worried about the borrowing they're gonna do. A lot of politicians and pundits have freaked out about this while economists are focused on this. All right, what we need to figure out is what's driving those huge deficits in coming decades. Deficits are the difference between federal spending and revenue. So let's look at those as a percent of GDP. The problem isn't a drop off in tax revenue. What economists are worried about is spending. So let's look at where the government actually spends its money. Conservatives might complain, it's obvious handouts. Liberals will say, it's obvious defense. Well. They're both wrong. So who's the biggest recipient of federal dollars? Grandma and grandpa. The government spends about a quarter of the budget on social security and another quarter on healthcare programs. A lot of that goes to retired people on Medicare. They deserve it, they worked hard. And those are the programs that are expected to grow as baby boomers retire and live longer. Defense and other discretionary programs are actually projected to shrink slightly as a percent of GDP. We'll be making another video on these specific topics later because we love making videos, but one thing's for sure, US policymakers will be forced to make some hard decisions about these future unfunded liabilities. So the answer is obviously just to keep borrowing more and more money, right? Well, not necessarily, let's go to the thought bubble. First, to borrow, you need lenders people who have decided to save money and loan it out rather than spend it on something else. But there's a finite amount of money that savers can lend, and most of that savings is borrowed by the private sector, which is consumers that take out car loans and businesses that pay for things like factories and computers. Now, when the government runs a budget deficit, it borrows from that same pool of savings. And if the government continues to borrow, many economists worry that there'll be fewer loans available for businesses, 
and that'll hurt the long-run growth of the economy. The second worry is the Greece scenario. A country's debt could grow so large that savers, individuals, businesses, and other governments might fear they'll never get paid back. They can stop lending money entirely, or they can lend at higher interest rates. Higher interest rates would make it harder to pay back the loan, which would likely lead to more debt, and eventually the government would simply be unable to pay its bills. That's called default, and it's basically terrible for everyone. The investors who loan the government money lose billions, and the government loses all credibility, and it causes a massive recession. That's what happened to Greece a few years ago. It's what happened to Argentina in 2001, Russia in 1998, and many other countries throughout history. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Fortunately, the U.S. has something called the debt ceiling, which is a cap on how much debt the U.S. Treasury can issue. The U.S. will never, ever, ever be able to borrow more than the ceiling, so debt can never get out of control. Mm, no. Remember the debt comes from repeated deficits. Deficits come from spending that's higher than revenues. The debt ceiling does nothing to cut spending or raise revenue. It just gets politicians into a big fight every few months. Basically, trying to cut the debt without raising revenue or cutting spending is like trying to lose weight by buying smaller clothes instead of with diet or exercise. It doesn't work. But there is good news for the U.S. First, both American and foreign lenders charge the U.S. government extremely low interest on its loans. That tells us they're confident in the government's ability to pay them back. And the low interest rates actually make it easier for the government to pay. Second, there are signs that the growth in healthcare costs could actually be slowing. Now, it's too early to tell if this is true, but if it is, the long-run budget picture will be much better than what we've shown. In fact, the projections for long-run deficits and debt have already been revised downward. Go us! So is all this debt going to destroy the American way of life? Like most things in economics and a crash course, the answer is complicated, and it depends a lot on what you're looking at as well as your political point of view. Looking at debt from the past or even the present is a good way to have political arguments, but it may not be a great way to think about the future. Right now, healthcare spending is driving the debt higher, but if a massive pandemic kills off half the world or there's a zombie apocalypse, after an initial spike, those healthcare costs are gonna fall. And frankly, in that case, the national debt and deficit spending will be the least of our worries. On that cheery note, we've gotta stop. Thanks for watching, see you next time. Thanks for watching Crash Course Economics. It was made with the help of all these nice people who do not have a deficit of talent. If you'd like to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, consider going over to Patreon. It's a voluntary subscription platform that allows you to pay whatever you want monthly to help Crash Course exist. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to be irrationally exuberant. Bonds are a common investment. However, to many investors, they remain a mystery. So let's explore what a bond is and how it might benefit your investment portfolio. A bond is simply a loan given to a company or government by an investor. By issuing a bond, a company or government borrows money from investors, who in return are paid interest on the money they've loaned. Companies and governments issue bonds frequently to fund new projects or ongoing expenses. Some investors use bonds in hopes of preserving the money they have while also generating additional income. Bonds are often viewed as a less risky alternative to stocks and are sometimes used to diversify a portfolio. Consider this example. The city of Fairview wants to build a new baseball stadium. So it decides to issue bonds to raise money. Each bond is a loan for $1,000, which Fairview promises to pay back in 10 years. To make this loan more attractive to investors, Fairview agrees to pay an annual interest rate of 5%, which in the bond world is also known as a coupon rate. An investor buys the bond at face value for $1,000. Now, let's fast forward. Each year, the city of Fairview pays the investor $50. These regular interest rates continue for the length of the bond, which is 10 years. Once the bond reaches maturity, the investor redeems his bond and Fairview returns his $1,000 principal investment. This bond was a good deal for both the city and our investor. Fairview got the money it needed to build the stadium. The investor received regular interest payments and the return of the original investment. Because a bond offers regularly scheduled payments and the return of invested principal, bonds are often viewed as a more predictable and stable form of investing. Compare regular payments of a bond to the experience of owning a stock. With stocks, profits and losses are driven by market forces and are generally less predictable. Of course, like any investment, bonds are not without risk. One risk that bond investors face what? is the possibility that the issuer defaults on paying back the principal. This is what is known as default risk. Typically, bonds with higher default risk also come with higher coupon rates. The amount of risk depends mostly on the financial stability of the issuer. 
For example, most governments are generally considered stable issuers and issue bonds with a relatively low coupon rate. Corporate bonds typically represent a greater risk of default, as companies can and do go bankrupt. That's why corporate bonds often offer a higher coupon rate. Several credit rating agencies assign rankings to different bonds. This can help bond investors to gauge the financial strength of the bond issuer. These ratings agencies often use different criteria for measuring risk. So, it's a good idea to compare ratings when considering a particular bond. And keep in mind, rating agencies aren't always accurate. So be sure to research hmm. a bond and its risks thoroughly before investing. Another risk to consider is interest rate risk. This is the risk that interest rates will go up and any bonds you own will be worth less if sold before the maturity date. After all, when interest rates rise, more investors allocate their money into the new, higher interest rate bonds. If you wanted to unload a low interest rate bond to take advantage of these new rates, you would have to sell your bond at a discount to make it a worthwhile purchase for another investor. Capital preservation and income generation are just two ways bonds might be part of a diversified portfolio. Many investors use a mix of stocks and bonds to pursue their investment goals. And because bonds move differently from stocks, they can help increase or protect portfolio returns. Keep in mind that this discussion showed you one simplified way that investors might use bonds, and only a few of the risks to consider. Like all investments, bonds are complex and have a variety of uses and risks. Before you invest in bonds, it's important that you invest in your own financial education. What is crowding out? Crowding out is a term used to describe a situation when expansionary fiscal policies decrease or crowd out private spending. Imagine an economy that's operating at full employment. Workers have jobs and factories are operating near capacity. If the federal government tries to increase spending to, say, build a new road, then it necessarily has to take away some people and some capital from other sectors of the economy. GDP wouldn't increase because there's already full employment. So, government spending would simply be crowding out private spending and investment and would not, in the short run, stimulate the economy. So when the government borrows to cover that additional spending, it affects the entire market for saving and borrowing. Let's look at how the government affects the supply and demand for loanable funds. We'll use some numbers here for illustration. Imagine the government decides to borrow $100 billion to build that new road. This shifts the demand for loanable funds up and to the right, increasing the equilibrium interest rate from 7% to 9%. A higher interest rate means that the quantity of savings supplied will increase, in this case, from 200 to $250 billion. Now remember that if savings increases by $50 billion, that means that private consumption is falling by $50 billion. If we're saving more, we're consuming less. And because borrowing has become more expensive due to that higher interest rate, private investment will also fall. At a 9% interest rate, we can see that the private demand for loanable funds is $150 billion, 50 billion less than it was at an interest rate of 7%. We call these two effects crowding out. So when the government borrows $100 billion, it crowds out private investment and private consumption. Now this assumes that the economy is operating at full employment. If the economy is in a recession, crowding out may not be an issue. Let's return to that original example, except this time the economy is in a recession and workers and capital are underemployed. If the government wants to build that new road, it can hire those underused resources and boost GDP without crowding out private sector spending. In this instance, government spending likely would increase GDP. To learn more about the complexities of fiscal policy, click here. Or to test your knowledge on crowding out, click here. Still here? Check out Marginal Revolution University's other popular videos. As we all know, 
debt is never free. One of the pressing issues is what happens when servicing the debt payments start to balloon out of control. Back in 2017, we saw a year that cut the deficit almost in half. We thought that President Donald Trump and his administration might actually reduce the amount of deficit spending. President Trump renegotiated for a vastly over budget F-15 projects and managed to push through a new tax bill. Then it all went wrong. If you're interested in monetary and U.S. economy related topics, don't forget to smash that bell icon so you never miss out on a future video. So let's take a look back a little bit to the problems that the national debt has taken over the past 15 years. We had the crash of 2008 that led to massive bailouts and government spending to prevent the crash of the financial sectors. But a crash with no reform is wasted and worthless, leading to the longest, slowest recovery in U.S. economic history. Every year under President Obama's administration, about $1.2 trillion was added to the deficit. President Donald Trump was handed off about $19 trillion worth of debt, the debt clock surpassing $20 trillion shortly after assuming office. This continuous deficit spending has not been stifled like we had hoped, and the trend of over $1 trillion of debt being added every year on average has continued. As we all know, debt is never free. One of the pressing issues is what happens when servicing the debt payments start to balloon out of control. As current trends stand, the interest rate as set by the Fed is climbing. This was not a threat during President Obama's time in office as obtaining new loans from the United States National Bank, the Federal Reserve, was getting close to free money with interest rates that were lower than 1%. This was consistent throughout the Obama administration. Admittedly, the problems that President Obama faced were not of his own making, but his actions and the actions of his administration made sure that the situation did not get any better. One of the largest economic challenges faced by the Trump administration is how to keep the economy ticking and service the ever-growing debt. At what point will the national debt become too large and start affecting the national budget negatively? Last year's total budget was $4.1 trillion. Servicing the national debt costs $310 billion, representing 5% of the national budget. If the debt continues to grow and interest rates rise to about 3.5%, as current trends and market stability allow, the interest payments on the debt will be 10% of the annual budget before the next election. Now what happens when we return to more historical interest rates ranging from 5% to 8%? At 5%, the debt payments could be knocking on the door of $1 trillion at $800 billion or around one-fifth of the national budget. And if interest rates rise to 8%, servicing the debt would break through the $1 trillion mark to about $1.4 trillion, or around one-third of the total national budget. Due to the large amount of debt and the rock-bottom interest rates, small increases in the interest rate mean larger and larger amounts of money are being diverted away from public spending. This is a problem that cannot be solved by simply paying off the national debt. More fundamental changes need to happen in our economy, banking sectors, and political spheres. Check out our other videos covering the national debt right here. All right, guys, so we're ready to move ahead. I hope those videos were helpful in understanding some things that typically in the past have been pretty complex, but um, ultimately with more visuals and more voices, I think it gets a little bit easier for us to do. We're now ready to wrap up our discussion of challenges to fiscal policy. This is the part of the discussion where I try to update you guys on where we've been and where it seems we're likely to be going. So I have some slides here I'd like to share with you. Um, these basically just kind of update your knowledge. Um, they're not going to be like specific questions on dollar amounts on the test, but you will need to know what the biggest components of our current federal budget are likely to be in the future. OK, I'm going to get rid of my face here and we will now uh, carry on with the PowerPoint. So. Um, typically, I like students to be aware of the trends that have changed over time, and our previous textbook gave us some numbers about federal government spending, um, you know, every hour, um, every day, and then also every year, so you could get an idea of the level of spending. But when we adopted a new textbook in 2011, uh, we saw some different numbers, so I imagine you can see, based on the videos I've already shown you, um, these spending levels have increased, okay? So now you can see that those uh, amounts are just about double, almost perfectly double, and that means that spending has definitely increased as a percent of GDP. In 2009, if you looked at what the spending um, uh, comprised, you can see that defense was number one, Social Security was number two, Medicare, Medicaid wrapped it up in number three. 
um, where they got the money to spend, I want you to make a note. It came by and large from private individuals. Um, individual income taxes, those are the federal income taxes that you're already familiar with, and those come out of your paycheck before anything gets spent by you, right? Um, Social Security and Social Insurance, if you're looking for the abbreviation FICA, that also comes out of your back pocket. So the green and blue wedges here, you can see most of the federal spending comes out of the taxpayer's pocket. Take a look for a second at corporate income taxes and the level by comparison. It's only 7%. So that means that by and large, most of the money that gets spent each and every year comes from the American taxpayer. And I'm a taxpayer, and I want you to be aware of that. Um, looking ahead to the federal budget 2010 for that year, um, I want you to know that the biggest players changed just a little bit, but by and large, you're seeing the same um, um, numbers, right? Uh, basically, talking about those top five can be challenging and political. Um, but the idea is that if, if someone's not talking about taking care of Social Security or making cuts or raising revenue to compensate for that, um, if they're not talking about realistic cuts to defense spending or some of the other top five programs that you see there, they're not significantly interested in really balancing the budget or decreasing the federal um, uh, debt. So uh, watch out for those political um, uh, presidential wannabes who talk about balancing the budget by getting rid of the EPA, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency or the National uh, Endowment for Education, or something that basically is, is just a small sliver of the pie that you see up here in the corner. They really need to talk about these uncomfortable things that involve a lot, a lot larger percentages of our spending. So just a word to the wise. But here you guys can see a picture on the left. That is the picture of our national debt clock. Um, it's, it's a private company that puts this up right outside the IRS office in New York City. And um, they've had problems in making sure it's updated um, um, with enough decimal spaces to, to show you what the actual picture of your national share of that debt is. But um, so uh, over that, I'll just overlay what this looks like graphically for 2010. You can see in the blue, that's the revenue that we took in. And the red, that's the, the amount that we actually spent. And there definitely was some deficit spending for the year. What's helpful in this graphic is that you can see what programs qualify as mandatory spending where there's a law on the books that says that has to be paid or the law has to be changed before any of those amounts can be altered. Uh, and the yellow that you see at the top, that's discretionary spending that can change every single year or maybe even during the year if Congress decides um, those levels need to be cut. But this will be helpful for you in identifying um, what comprises mandatory versus discretionary spending. So I want you to take a look and see. Mandatory spending by and large is eating up the lion's share of what we have uh, or what we have collected each year. And we're going to have to have some tough conversations to figure out how to alter those amounts because those are spending levels required by law. So um, looking at 2011 by comparison, same kind of picture here. Um, you can see um, blue on the right is the total spending for that year and red is the size of the deficit. Now, keep in mind, you add that red amount every single year to a picture of the national debt and you get quite a large chunk of change that at some point is going to have to be paid back by the American taxpayer. If I take a second to look at these historical comparisons, guys, this is a link to a website that compares where we've been and where we're likely to go. Give it a second to load here and I'll show you what has been happening over time to the amounts that have been collected and the amounts that are being spent. We'll also get the chance to kind of look and see how many years have we had a surplus in our our national budget. Um, and you're going to find pretty quickly that's not been um, the lion's share of where we are. Okay, so now you can see where I got that graphic. Um, here, let's look at tax revenues um, historically. All right, so taking a look now, you guys can see um, back in the early part of the 20th century, corporate income taxes, excise taxes, basically comprised a larger share of all the revenue that's collected by the federal government. We have to accept the fact that history has proven the case that whenever corporate income taxes are decreased 
are allowed to diminish, then the rest of it has to be made up by the American taxpayer. Make no mistake, if they don't get it from corporations, they're going to be coming to you for that. So spending, um, this is the way that money has been spent over time. You can see mandatory spending by uh, national trend has grown. Uh, defense spending has diminished somewhat. Um, Non-defense discretionary and the net interest on the debt comprise the rest of that. But by and large, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare are growing as a percentage of our total expenditures. Spending by agency here, you can see where the money uh, goes with more detail, but it shows basically the same picture. And then this graphic I love here shows basically um, where we've seen our, our worst deficits, okay? There's only a few years we can point at where we've actually had surplus budgets. Um, the trend is toward larger deficit spending, especially since the era of the Great Recession and now what we're calling the Great Pause, um, this COVID uh, kind of crisis that's uh, making us spend more than what we take in taxes. Um, I think looking at that information, you guys can see that the, the U.S. federal budget and the U.S. federal government by default is basically losing its ability to respond to crisis. Um, it's a real problem that will have to be addressed. So um, over time, you'll see um, larger criticisms of whether or not this is actually a good tool to use. But additional budgets show us basically the same uh, picture where you see the top five things um, that comprise the large amounts of spending. You can see again in, in spending in 2015. Um, you can see it again uh, with the revenue here. Um, I'll note that in 2015, even though corporate income taxes increased, almost practically doubled, still the lion's share of taxes are coming out of your, your back pocket. And that, that should make you like really, you know, interested in voting your specific interests as a young voter. Um, traditionally, over time, we've seen that young voters just kind of ride off this whole situation like there's nothing they can do about it. And that's exactly why I'm showing you this. If you are tired of seeing these large expenditures on Social Security and defense, then it's your um, uh, it's going to be your your job to respond to that by voting um, your conscience at the polls. So moving ahead, you guys are hearing my dogs in the background. The garbage trucks have just pulled up. So life goes on, doesn't it? Um, here for the most recent uh, stuff I could find online, I think this is 2018, no, 2019, sorry. You can see what money was spent as a portion of revenue. And then um, you can see what we actually spent in the deficit spending for the year. So it gives you kind of an idea that this really hasn't been addressed. Um, we've been distracted at the political level by a lot of different uh, things that have nothing to do with federal um, um, uh, stability. So I'm hoping that over time uh, we'll be able to address this with uh, future administrations. You know, it might be tempting, guys, to basically blame either the Republicans or the Democrats. But I think if you look at this graphic, you can see that both administrations, both parties, had a hand in putting us in this particular situation. So during the Clinton era, guys, we had an era of large surpluses um, and people were arguing over how they would be spent. Primarily, um, you can see that President Bush um, had an economic downturn along with some other policies that meant large spending cuts into that billion dollar surplus so that by um, the era of Obama, that money was gone. That spend spending increased or continued with the Great Recession, you can see here. Um, and those, those spending programs have been continued. <laughs> 